So thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Um, I'll be talking about beliefs in this talk. So as uh, a social scientists, we are interested in understanding people's decisions and in order to predict what they will be uh, choosing in the future. Now, a key input into the way people make decisions is uh, what they believe about the environment they are in. So for example, if you are thinking about hiring a job candidate, well, hiring or not hiring depends on your beliefs about the f his skill. Okay, that will be a good candidate or a bad worker. Similarly, if you want to thinking about buying a stock, the decision of buying versus not buying depends on your beliefs about f future price movements. So if you want to understand people's decisions and pre predict people's decisions, we need to have a, a model that explains and predicts how people form beliefs. So how to do a uh, standard assumption in economics and finance is that given current information, people actually know the true features of the, the variable of interest. So for example, in the job uh, candidate example, if you're try thinking about hiring somebody and you know where they studied, you know their, uh, how they performed in an in interview, you will form an accurate belief of their skill distribution going forward. So maybe the, the, the candidate will turn out to be a bit better than you thought, maybe you, he'll turn out to be a bit worse than you thought, but on average, you have an accurate, correct prediction. On average, there will be no surprise, okay? So this is a very important feature that on average there's no surprise because it says that in some, in some sense you are doing the best use of the information you have. There's no way to go better to, go to you know, improve your forecasts if there's already no surprise, okay? Now, because this is um, you know, such a kind of a rational thing to do, we, we're going to call this the rational expectations hypothesis. Now, in, in economics, in finance, rational expectations hypothesis refers to something broader, but here within this talk, I will, talk ab I will refer to it as knowing the, true, uh, the, knowing the truth about uh, the variable of interest. Okay? Thank you. Let me just ask a question. Sure. Um, so I, I see what you're saying, but if, if there are asymmetric information, and you have to use like perfect Bayesian equilibrium, you might not have the true belief, the true distribution of the equilibrium. Absolutely, no. We can, no. Of course, in many cases, we want to think about learning and about you know, asymmetric information. We'll abstract for this from this for the moment. We will see that even in this most simple case, where we expect that people uh, do have, um, can, can form uh, uh, correct beliefs, that will not be the case. Okay, and then I'll show you what happens when you have learning going forward. Now, an implication of this assumption of rational expectations is that, in fact, over time, there has been relatively little attention paid to actual evidence on people's beliefs and people's expectations. Okay? To the extent that some, some people would even say that asking people what they believe is a noisy exercise, you will get some noisy data and you see you can't really, it's a misleading data, you can't really use that data. And in fact, in other uh, aspects <coughs> of social science, uh, in other areas of like psychology and sociology, people are actually very interested in precisely this question of how beliefs depart from, systema systematically depart from true beliefs. And a case in point is stereotypes. So what's a stereotype? If you take the Oxford Dictionary, which is the ultimate word in this, a stereotype is an oversimplified image of a type of person or thing. So it's an oversimplified image. That's the key idea. And the psychology literature emphasizes that stereotypes are ubiquitous. We use them in every sphere of our lives. So we have stereotypes about racial groups, like Asians are good in math, so maybe it's mostly a US stereotype. Uh, about demographic groups, like People from Florida are elderly. Again, the US-based stereotypes. And but that's, it also applies to all kinds of groups and classes that you might think about. So you might think that bonds are safe generically and you neglect the fact that some bonds are actually risky. Now the idea of, of, of stereotypes, of, of why they, they, they come about in the way we think, is that you know, perhaps they help simplify assessments, simplify judgments. Uh, but they also can distort judgments. They also can distort beliefs. Okay? So some stereotypes might be broadly accurate. Like, for example, Dutch people are tall. That's on average true. The average Dutch person is very tall. But other stereotypes are inaccurate. So for example, Florida residents are elderly is actually kind of a very inaccurate stereotype. Only a small minority of Florida residents are actually elderly. And so, you know, if you, if you make decisions based on such beliefs, such stereotypical 
oversimplified beliefs, um, that you may be making suboptimal decisions. So the question here is whether this, this big literature that studies how stereotypes work, is this informative about the type of beliefs that we generate when we have to make economic or, or finance decisions? Pedro, uh, is, is a general assumption that, that stereotypes uh, sort of reduce cognitive load or, or, or cognitive processing? Is, that, is it a bit like food heuristics in the sense that you create categories that make it easier? That's exactly to right. Well, we'll do certain things, or spelling certain things, but where you then might also just get it wrong. That's right. That's what I'm going to the next slide, which is the idea is what are the models that people have about what's generating stereotypes. So in economics, you have the statistical discrimination literature, which says that uh, you know, it's basically the idea that of rational expectations, that you know, when you see somebody from a group or conditional on some information, um, uh, you'll have an accurate, uh, on average, accurate assessment of their type. Okay, so these are accurate stereotypes. The whole point is that a lot of times, stereotypes are actually not accurate. So this is a, a limited uh, explanation for uh, what we see. The sociology literature is also very concerned with stereotypes, but it takes a different angle to it. This often it focuses on pejorative and, ina and particularly inaccurate social, type, social stereotypes about particular social groups. It's very focused on stereotypes about social groups. Um, and it often directed the minorities, maybe with motivated beliefs type of thing. Okay? So it's, again, it's a imp very important aspect of, of stereotypes about social groups, but it's a kind of a, it's narrower than the full picture that we want to derive. Then there's a literature in the, in the cognitive psychology, which says the following. As a cognitive process, stereotyping seems pretty much like business as usual. These are simply generalizations. So this is already pointing to the fact that this is a very broad kind of thought process. It's a generalization. And this might apply to a lot of different situations. Now, what else do they, does, does the psych literature say about stereotypes? What are the properties that they talk about? They say stereotypes are selective. <coughs> They're localized around group features that are the most distinctive about that group that provide the greatest differentiation between groups. Show the least within group variation. So this comes to, to Felix's question, which is when you make a stereotype, you focus on the, on the features of a given group that most easily allows to distinguish that group from an alternative group. So in that sense, it simplifies. Yes? That basically brings to my mind this whole body of literature with respect to rules of thumb that the inferior was in thumb and all of these people used to develop in the 80s. It was basically what is the outcome of the stereotype is to develop into the kind of rational expectation for Bayesian updating and perhaps some sort of generic rules of thumbs, mm -hmm. then you go on and you take your decision. Well, um, you know, uh, a rule of thumb is a little different from uh, what we're doing here. This might look like a rule, uh, but I'll come back to this later. A rule of thumb, thumb is something that's kind of uh, a little bit insensitive to the environment where you're in. You just apply this rule. Whereas here, as we'll see, the type of stereotypes that will arise are extremely sensitive to the information that you have available. So it's not just like you decide uh, on a rule of thumb. Here we derive stereotypes from the actual true properties of these groups. The argument of the rules of thumb at the time was exactly the opposite in the sense that you know, when we decide to meet in New York, and we say we'll meet in the train station, then the rule of thumb is to meet in Grand Central rather than Penn Station. And that's logically determined by the presence of Grand Central and Penn Station. So it's not independent of the information that people have about you know, the infrastructure. No, and yes, yes. <coughs> but you're talking about like a focal point thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, yes. uh, Subsequently, they did all of this focal point literature. Yes. I think, so, okay, I don't want, it's a bit far from this, but uh, I think the, uh, uh, how people try come up with focal points is an interesting question, which might be related to this. It's a little, yeah. I'll try to go back to it. Uh, sorry, yes. Which might be, excuse me. 
just quick, quickly, can you explain the difference between the, the rational expectation of the group's types and the Hilton von Hippel? Yes. Uh, I'll give you an, an example of this in a couple of slides, but if you like, I can. Well, they are, they are, they are very different, yes, yes. It's precisely, again, you can think about the Florida elderly example. The Florida elderly example is that um, if you have to assess what's the average age of a person that comes from Florida, it should be, you know, whatever, 30 or 35 or something. It's kind of the average age in the US pretty much. The, uh, in the, when, you, when you think about this, this account of stereotypes, what it says is that you think, when you think about Florida, you think about a, the most distinctive type of Floridian, which according to this theory is the elderly person. And therefore, you basically think everybody in Florida, in the extreme, you think everybody in Florida is, very, is 65. Um, you were talking about you're going to verify these against true properties. And I wonder if in markets, most of the time, there are no true properties necessarily. So you give a, a, a bank, a run on a bank, for example, right? Yes. So we hear rumors and it becomes a self fulfilling dynamic. Absolutely. But even in social psychology, we can go and verify how tall somebody is. Yes. But things like talent, skill, there's a self fulfilling dynamic. Absolutely. And, and there's a treatment effect, right? That's right. And, and so is there a way to sort of tease that out of this? And, and maybe you don't deal with those situations at all. A little bit, but yeah. OK. <laughs> so you'll come back to it. But, but it I, seems I like so you're, you're treating it. There's a true reality out yes. there. Uh, but I, I'm interested in sort of the, like I said, the fact that police are self-fulfilling uh, in markets in particular, but also in social psychology. We know that there's, that, you know, if you treat that, kids as yes. smart, that yes. they will treat problems differently than if you treat Absolutely. them as dumb. And so uh, yeah. this is very true. And so what this says is that any kind of underlying difference, even if though it might can be very small between groups, if people have these beliefs that uh, focus on the differences, right. they will, in fact, believe groups to be very different, and then the, the, the self-fulfilling dynamics become even, even worse, and they will amplify any of these things. So this would be a channel of amplification for that. For that uh, yeah. OK, so let me uh, say what we do. Uh, we are based on this idea of, of uh, cognitive psychology as stereotypes being selective, selective representations of groups. I'll present the model of stereotypical beliefs. It's based on this idea by Kahneman and Tversky of representativeness heuristic. What's this idea? It's an idea that describes how we make probabilistic judgments. So what do they say? They say that we judge the frequency of an attribute by its similarity, by how similar it is, or how representative it is, of the parent population, of the data generating process. Okay? It's in this sense that it's not a rule of thumb. It's like, we'll come back to that. Uh, so, Carmen Tversky argues that uh, this type of uh, thinking through similarity, or thinking through representativeness, drives biases in probabilistic judgments. So we have things like the Bayes rate neglect, that I'll come back to later, the conjunction fallacy, the junction fallacy, and a couple of other things. I'll just to illustrate, the conjunction fallacy is a pretty uh, striking finding. It says, uh, this is, here's one example, a very famous example that Kamen Tversky wrote about Linda, uh, who is a single, outspoken, and bright 31-year-old woman who was an activist in college. And then they ask people, do you think, what's the likelihood that she's currently a bank teller? What's the likelihood that she's currently a feminist bank teller? And people separately say that she's more, more likely to be a feminist bank teller than she is to be a bank teller. So violates a conjunction rule of probabilistic, of probabilities. And the idea is, again, the following. When you ask how likely is Linda to be a bank teller, you know, the, this activist uh, uh, thing in the past is not similar to people's perceptions of a bank teller. But instead, when you remind them that she can be a feminist bank teller, that's very, it's very similar to a feminist bank teller. And so uh, people, up there, you know, people think that she's more likely to be a feminist bank teller. So this is how kind of the broad idea. How do Kamen Tversky propose that this measure of similarity of representativeness works? They say, an attribute is, is representative of a class if it's diagnostic of that class. Namely, if it's much more likely in that class or in that group than in a relevant comparison class. Okay? So this is like the, the one, uh, one formula in the, in the presentation. It just says how we implement this idea. So a decision maker you know, has to uh, assess the distribution of an attribute like skill in a given group, G, like 
Oxford students. And that's a true distribution. What representative says is that when assessing this distribution, we compare the probability of, of a given skill level in a group to the same skill level in a different group. So skill in, from, uh, in mathematics, for example, from Oxford students versus skill from Cambridge students, if you will. Okay? And this is the, you know, using the true information that's accessible to you. So that's, that this mathematical information plays no role here. And what people do is that they then overweight those types that are more associated with your group in a sense that they have a higher likelihood of being present in your group than in the comparison group. And they overweight those types that have a high likelihood ratio and underweight those types that have low likelihood ratio. Okay, so again, it's, uh, think about the Florida example. Um, it is true that the elderly are a little more frequent in Florida than they are in the rest of the US population. So for T equal elderly, this ratio is kind of large. And so you focus on the elderly, you neglect the rest, and you overestimate the average age. So what's the interpretation that, that, that we have in mind for this process? It connects, connects the idea of representativeness to the idea of associative memory that is actually kind of an idea from neuroscience, actually. The idea is that recall, so you, ha you have some information in your, in your mind about this group. You, you think about the group, you draw information from memory, but recall is limited and selective. So when you think about this group, say Oxford students or Florida residents, the first thing that comes to mind are the types that are most representative, that have the highest uh, likelihood ratio, and you overweight those types. They are kind of front of your mind, you overweight them. But these types need not be the most likely types. So this representation may not be accurate. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the overall idea. So, so basically, here you're developing a model of imperfect recall, right? That's right. That's right. It's imperfect recall, but crucially, as in this example, the imperfection of the recall depends on what group you're thinking about and what's kind of the reference group, what's kind of the benchmark relative to which this group has some distinctive properties. So it's the recall of distinctive properties of a group, but what's distinctive about a group comes from comparing the group to some other group. That no. Yes. That evolves. That, that evolves. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. That's kind of the important part. So let me go through a kind of a, a quick example. Uh, so again, suppose you <laughs> your task, your important economic decision-making task is to assess the share of Irish people who have to have red hair. Okay? Uh, now, as you might know, uh, Irish people are among the people, the national populations that have the highest share of red hair. It's kind of a genetic uh, trait. So 10% of them have red hair, and then there's some distribution about, you know, from light hair and dark hair. The world population at large, or even the, the European population, if you will, has a much, sorry, much lower share of red hair. Okay? So basically here you have two groups, the Irish and the others, and you think about the Irish, and you think what's red, what hair color do they have? The first thing that pops to mind is red hair. Why? Because red hair is the most distinctive property of the Irish relative to the rest of the population in the sense that once you hear I uh, Irish, the probability of red hair goes up by a factor of 10. So once you hear, you have information, okay, I'm looking at this group, I think about the Irish, boom. Uh, the, 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 what changes the most is the probability of the red hair. It goes up, and that's, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. So the stereotype of the Irish has, is a red-haired person, it is its most distinctive feature, uh, you know, according to this definition, but of course it's inaccurate in the sense that only a very small percentage of uh, Irish have red hair. Okay? So this is kind of the way the model works. And what I'll try to do in the next uh, you know, 45 minutes is to uh, describe an ongoing research agenda with Nicola Genioli and Andre Schleifer that we have based on this, type, on this idea of stereotypical beliefs. And I'll talk about two things. First, I'll talk a bit about stereotypes in the way they usually thought about, so b beliefs about social groups. This is work with Katie Kaufman. Uh, and then I'll talk about diagnostic expectations, which is to ab apply this idea to how people form beliefs about the future in a dynamic process, and how they react when they get new information about the future. 
And then I'll show two applications, one to credit cycles, two to the credit market, and one to the stock market. Okay, so let me first go back to the idea that stereotypes might be accurate or might not be accurate. Okay, so here what we have is the voting patterns of two groups. We have people from Hawaii and people from Texas. And this is how they voted in the recent US election. There are two types of voters in each state. They can be Democrat or Republican. Now you see that for Hawaii, most people are Democrats. For Texas, most people are Republicans. So what are these two groups like? Well, they're very distinct, they're very different because most Hawaiians are, have one type and most, most Texans have another type. So how do stereotypes work when you have groups that are different like this? Well, what is the stereotype of a guy from Hawaii? He's a, uh, the stereotype of a Hawaiian voter is a Democratic voter because that's what maximizes the likelihood ratio. So here, the most probable type, the most probable person is also the most representative person. So stereotypes are accurate in a sense that the first thing you think about is also the most correct thing or the modal thing, if you wish. This happens when groups are very different, when the probability mass is concentrated in different types. What happens when groups are very similar? So here we have SAT math scores for men and women in the US. Now, I'm going to avoid the issues about you know, investment from the parents, from the people, from the students, from the, you know, all the things that go into making this graph the way it is. The key thing about this graph is that the two groups are broadly indistinguishable. They're very similar, men and women. Okay? Yet, there's a strong gender stereotype that men are better than women in math. In fact, you know, I'll talk about some evidence later on. What do we have to say about this? Well, compare these two groups. People who have very, they're, they're very separate people. People who have high quality, people who have low quality, so high skill and low skill. People who have very high skill in math, that type of people is very representative, is very stereotypical of being ma a male because the probability of high quality given male is higher than the probability of high quality given female. Okay, even though very, very, very few people have very high skill, there's a little bit more of male and a little bit less of female. And so the stereotype of, um, uh, you know, a, a, a boy, a man, in, uh, in this SAT math test is having very good, very good grades. In fact, representativeness is very high for high grades in men and is low for low grades in men. So what happens here is that the groups are very, very similar. So what is distinctive about one group relative to the other? Well, it's mostly the tails. That's where the probability mass is most different, is in the tails. So the stereotypes focuses on the tails and completely forgets the fact that broadly the two groups are identical. So stereotypes are very inaccurate when the groups are very similar. So what happens, you know, according to the model? Well, so this is the true distribution. Uh, the stereotypes will emphasize these, these uh, types of people, the, these quality ranges for men, because the, quality, the likelihood ratio is higher, will de-emphasize those. And so the stereotypical beliefs, if you will, will shift the male performance to the right and shift the female performance to the left. So what does it do? Even if the two groups are, have very similar means, on a, so on average they are very, very, very close to each other, the stereotypical beliefs will exaggerate the difference between groups. Okay, that's what happens with, uh, with stereotypes. So this is what is called the kernel of truth hypothesis in, in uh, psychology, which is that stereotypes exaggerate true but perhaps very small underlying differences. Okay, and, you know, in fact, there's, there's a lot of evidence in the, in the general literature in economics that talks to, this, uh, to these be beliefs being actually wrong. Okay, so, <coughs> Stereotypes exaggerate uh, differences. That's, I think, a key property of the model. And this leads to, to the fact that when stere because stereotypes exaggerate differences, they also, our beliefs also overreact when we receive information that is diagnostic about a little, some difference. So, for example, here, sorry, here, if you didn't know the gender of a student, you would predict uh, this distribution of, so on average a student would be here, 
If I now tell you the student is a girl, you will excessively reduce your expectation of performance. If I tell you the student is a boy, you will excessively increase your expectation of performance. In this way, you overreact to information. Here's another example. It's kind of a, kind of a famous example from the, 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 this literature. Um, it's the following. Suppose, you, as a doctor, you, you have to assess. You're, you're testing a patient. The patient might have a disease, maybe not. So a patient might be sick or healthy. But as a doctor, you will you'll test the patient and see what happens. If you receive information that the test is positive, if the test is informative at all, what happens is that the probability of being sick when you have a positive test for the disease goes up. So this, the likelihood ratio of being sick in the, in the people who pos tested positive is, very, is high. So obviously, when you test positive for a disease, the first thing that comes to mind is that you're sick. The stereotypical um, thinking hypothesis says that you exaggerate the informativeness of this test because you focus too much on, on this type being sick whose probability went up. Okay? And in fact, you know, th there's, there's interesting evidence from, from medical students who, say, who are asked, you know, there's the given test with a given uh, you know, false, like, uh, false positive ratio, given false negative ratio. You take the test, the person is positive, how likely is it that the person is, is sick, and they give completely uh, uncalibrated answers. Okay? They, they just say that, the, basically they say the, prob the probability of this person being sick is equal to one after they take a positive test. Okay, so this is an example of overreacting to diagnostic information that comes out of this model, and it's, it's more, more broadly it's called uh, base rate neglect. Okay? So I, I've talked about two properties of the stereotypical model. One is, uh, you know, when, when a stereotype's accurate, the kernel of truth hypothesis, and now uh, another property which is context dependence, as Mitch was saying. The belief, the stereotypical beliefs about a given group is, you know, it's, it's centered around the distinctive properties of that group. And so, it depends about, uh, on what group you're comparing it to. So, going back to our example of the Irish being red-haired, that's a, red hair is a distinctive property of the Irish when you compare it to a generic European person. But if you compare it to the Scots, it's not so distinctive because Scots also are, you know, 10% of them have red hair. So that red hair is not a distinctive property of the Irish when you compare them to the Scots. You know, perhaps a distinctive property would be religion, or Catholic versus Protestant, for example. But the idea is that what, what is stereotypical of a group, what's distinctive about a group, depends on what group you're comparing it to. And so this allows, this is a, is a, is a, is a you know, generates very clear testable predictions, okay? Um, that, you know, violate rational expectations, obviously, uh, which we, and in fact, we tried to test this hypothesis in the past. So we, we, I will not go into much detail, but we run a little test where uh, we showed uh, students different groups of, of people and asked them about what they thought about one group of people as we varied the properties of the other group, okay? And then we showed that the, the, you know, the answers that people gave about this group depends on how the other group is. Okay? So, um, so yes. when you say expectations about the group, um, yeah. we think of generally like first order moments. On average, I would expect these people to yes. be this type. Like they, people generally probably don't form things about distributions. That's right. That's right. So here we, we, exp we ask things like the mode or, you know, depending on, on, the, on the specific experiments, whether the mode or the average. And so we could see what happened to the mode at the average. Yeah, it's not easy to, make, to, to run these experiments because, you know, eliciting uh, information like this is a little noisy. But, uh, but they, the, the experiments went the way we, we expected. Okay, and so we also ran some empirical tests. Yes, sorry. So there's a big debate in this literature on whether these are rational heuristics, rules of thumb. So if, if I'm asked in Hawaii, you know, we, we do a draw of a single person from Hawaii, are they a Republican or a Democrat? I haven't lived there, but I 
I'd probably just say Democrat. Um, I think people have more nuanced views if they're informed, as in I've lived in Hawaii, or I've lived in Texas, and, and so, so there's sort of this basing update that goes on that makes people more rational over time as they have interactions. But I, I, I can't get quite a sense of where you fall in terms of this debate, sort of Giga Renzer and you know, others who say that these biases are, are rational things that are useful for us in everyday interactions because it's very hard to keep track of all these possible things that we can have information about you know, uh, versus the Kahneman approach, which is that there's something really bad about this. And so where do you, do you, where do you so, see? Because what, what you've said so far seems to be sort of in the Kahneman camp in terms yes. of it's very much this is bad stuff, and, and, and it needs to be corrected. Is that right? That's correct. It, it is. It is in a in a, in a Kahneman camp. Okay. Uh, it is, but it is again. It's a, the idea of trying to understand how people come up with these estimates. Okay, and they are testable. Like the, the fact that it depends. The estimate that you have for Hawaii depends on whether you're comparing it to the U.S. Right. to D.C., sure. which is even more democratic than Hawaii, right, right. or to Texas, which is even like more Republican than the average U.S. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is that this, these are not things that are ex ante in your mind that you have this rule that whenever people think about Hawaii, you think about Democrat. No. On the spot, you try to elicit right. from memory information to, f to answer that question. The way you recall information to answer that question depends on what's most distinctive about Hawaii sure. relative to other things that you're thinking about. Of course, it depends on the information that you have in brain. Of course, as you learn, your information will evolve and you'll have a more accurate picture of Hawaii. Yeah. But even if you have a perfectly accurate picture of Hawaii, and this is all conditioning on the information people have. If people have the perfect picture of Hawaii, and if I compare Hawaii to DC, yeah. I will still think, you know, there's a lot of uh, Republicans in Hawaii. Right. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sort of channeling, so David Funder and, and Kruger at Brown and others who say that there's this realistic accuracy model. And essentially, in real context, what we're doing is we're constantly updating our sort of priors about distributions of, you know, whether, whether it's skill or, you know, all kinds of assumptions. And in the lab, you get certain effects, but what you get in, in, in other contexts, what a la Gigarenzer is, and we use them wrote that book that just came out that sort of says that these are actually useful, and then we're constantly updating them. And so I'm, I'm sort of channeling that a little bit to say these can be quite useful, and it seems like in real context. It can be useful because. What's, it can be useful because. Because, like I said, if, if, if there's a draw from the population of Hawaiians, and I was asked if they're Republican or Democrat, my bet. You know, yes, yes, you know, of course. Yeah, of course. And so, no, but so, here, here, here. So it's, it's, it's rational in the sense uh, that. I, th I think it's important, it's very important, and it's going to be very important here yeah. to distinguish between rational as in being in the correct direction right. and rational as being correctly calibrated. Okay. So everything here is, r what you're saying is, right. of course, you know, if I have, if I know it's Hawaii, I'll update my, my right. the question is how much? I and I think in finance in particular, it's extremely important to be, to understand whether you're correctly calibrated or not correctly calibrated. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, w uh, so one thing about being good or not good, um, obviously, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not making any uh, judgments about whether it's good or not good, it's just kind of a, it seems to be a feature of how people think. Okay, so I just want to uh, talk about a little bit about some empirical tests that, that we ran as well. And the idea here, it's important to run empirical tests because it's about the external validity of the model, right? How does it apply to actual beliefs that people uh, hold out there? And uh, we do this in two, in two steps. First, we, we take some data and then we t uh, some true data and some data on beliefs and we compare them. And we, we want to do two things. First, we want to see whether the beliefs actually exaggerate differences across groups as the model would predict. That in itself could be a very simple mechanism. You know, you can maybe just say, okay, this is better than that one, so I'll just exaggerate the difference. Second, so that's not enough to show what the model is doing. So we just, we, the second step is to say, What's driving the belief distortion, how much you exaggerate, is actually predictable by the, uh, how the, by the true distributions. So some distributions will lead to very big belief distortions. Some other distributions will be, lead to very little belief distortions. And we can actually test this in the data. So we did, uh, we t we did this for stereotypes about Democrats, Democrats versus Republicans, about what kind of views they hold for kind of different moral and policy related topics. And exactly as we suggested, it is the, the, you have to know the entire distribution itself to better predict where beliefs are. It's not just knowing that Democrats are more liberal than Republicans. 
But then we also did uh, uh, as an empirical test with beliefs about gender. And I want to just spend one minute speaking about this because I think it's interesting. We ran an experiment where a lot of US students were doing quizzes in min many topics like math, sports, verbal, uh, reasoning, and other things. Okay? Then, after they did their, their, their quizzes, we paired them pairwise uh, with a different person who could be of the same gender or of a different gender, of the opposite gender. Okay? And they say, now you're going to play in teams. But before you play in teams, tell me how you performed in the task you did before. And what we find is that male subjects are more, so they're, first of all, they're overconfident, <laughs> which is maybe not surprising. Uh, in fact, everyone's over, by the way, everyone's overconfident. It's just that males are more overconfident than, women, than females. Men are more overconfident than, men, than women, but both are overconfident. But men are relatively even more overconfident when they are paired with women in tasks that are stereotypically male tasks, like sports and math. So this is about the beliefs that you have about yourself, which, you know, sh presumably you have all the information you can, being shaped by the fact that you're paired with somebody whom you think is worse than you. So this is, it, it really illustrates the fact that it's not about kind of rules of thumb or, or about static rules of beliefs. It's about the fact that you're trying to answer the question on the spot. You're thinking, you're trying to recall information about how good are you in this, or how did, well did you do? And the fact that you're paired with, with a woman in sports makes you think that you're better than you really are. Controlling, you know, for everything else. So it's really about, it illustrates how beliefs are a product of recall, and that recall has some properties, like being selective and limited, that distorts beliefs in systematic ways. Okay, so this is, you know, we're quite excited about this. All right, so this, this, this uh, finishes the, uh, the review of the stereotypes part of the, the, so beliefs about social groups part of the, of the talk. And you know, I will now move to expectations, unless there are questions, yes. Before you move on, just a quick question, more out of curiosity than anything else, is there an asymmetry in the way that these beliefs are updated, the <coughs> function of whether or not the new information either goes along with the stereotype or goes against? Yes. There's biases in the way yes. that um, if, so if I'm paired up with uh, a female, I may be um, more overconfident, but more overconfident than I would be, become lesser overconfident if paired up with a male. So is the, the, the stuff that goes along with the stereotype may update our beliefs and our priorities even more, by more in even exacerbating the stereotype. That's right. I think that, so wait, so, wait. so th this is exactly uh, the margin we use to identify this effect. I thought you were referring to something slightly different, which is what if I tell you that uh, this girl comes from like a very distinguished mathematics program, for example. Mm -hmm. um, well, then, then, yeah, there, there is an asymmetry. You kind of tend to respond more to things that go along with the stereotype, at least in our specification, uh, and less to things that are against it, unless the evidence against the stereotype is sufficiently large that it complete, completely switches, and then you have a huge overreaction. But the example you're giving is, is, a, is, a, is a big uh, counterweight to the stereotypes. So the one that I just gave. Yeah, yeah, we didn't run this here, actually. An esteemed map program that should outweigh the... Uh, uh, more well, yes. It, 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 yeah. We didn't run it, but there's some evidence that it's not quite enough. Uh, more thinking, you may be familiar with this, that Pali Sharap, the social neuroscientist, the optimism bias, how people update their beliefs about the potentiality of the event occurring. And if it, if it confirms what they already thought, they update their priors much more yes. than when they don't think uh, yes. when the information goes against Absolutely, the, yeah. the, the error first quality. Well, the, the, the mechanism... So finding something similar. Well, it's a bit different. So the, first of all, here we're talking about beliefs about past performance. So it's not about future. And second, um, it, there's no, what's important here is that it's not motivated. There's no motivation. I, I don't want to feel good because I think I'm going to do well. In that sense, there's no kind of optimism bias. You can be, optimi you can be over optimistic or over pessimistic. It depends on what's the thing that's at the top of your mind. There's no kind of, you don't calibrate your beliefs to be happy about them. That's kind of a complicated uh, model, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Is it symmetric? Do you get it the other way around? So women paired with men? That's interesting. Uh, less so. So that's an interesting. Nice. <laughs> women are less over overconfident. And they're also they're less sensitive to this type of manipulation. So the women are generically better calibrated. 
The effect being, you know, in things where women and men are competing with each other, that there will be excess entry from men, and men will be too eager to start, you know, going to math courses, engineering, whatever, because in relative terms, they are much more overconfident in, in math. You know, in other, in other settings, it might be better to be better calibrated, but it's not clear in this setting what's best. Whether you, like, there's this thing about entrepreneurship that, you know, it's good for people to, if people are, are well, in, well calibrated, they will not start a business. In fact, it might be good for if they are over-optimistic to start a business. Sorry. Okay, so I'll then go to the next uh, part, which is about st um, expectations. So what's the difference from what we just saw to expectations? The idea is that expectations is a dynamic setting. We're, like in finance, uh, we often have, there's a process over time, and we want to form beliefs about what the state of the world, for example, will be tomorrow. Okay, and our actions today depend on our expectations about the state of the world tomorrow. How do we transport the idea of stereotypes to the setting, well, think about, again, the Irish example. What happens there is that you receive data, the person is Irish, that shifts your posterior distribution, your, your beliefs, and what happens is that you shift your beliefs too much in the direction of the data. Okay, you think, you think people, there was zero likelihood that they were red-haired, now there's higher likelihood and you kind of overshoot. So you, you inflate or you overestimate the outcome that, that whose likelihood became went up the most given the data. So this is exactly what we're going to to, to do here. Uh, as people receive news about you know, the variable of interest, say the state of the world, if they receive good news, that means tomorrow it's more likely that things are going to be good, and I overestimate the likelihood of these good events that became more likely because of the good news I got today. Yes. Sorry, just to go back to it, but does it, I mean, also following that Mike is saying, is that if it goes in the opposite direction in a symmetrical fashion? Yes, oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. bad news, will, will it yes, will of course. tomorrow be you're too impacted uh, your expectations of tomorrow as you would? Absolutely, the model is completely symmetric. I thought my search was about men versus women, but well, yeah, it's uh, more general, I think. But, uh, but here it's totally symmetric, yes. It's really about what's the content of new information and the fact that you exaggerate the content of new information. Although the direction of the new information could be aligned with what you're already thinking or less aligned and that could influence the way, the, the extent to which you update. Yes, in fact, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, kind of a trivial, it's a trivial generalization of the model to, 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 to get that. So for example, if instead of just focusing on today's news, you focus on the past month's news, you can have you, if, if most of the news were positive for the past month, and now you have negative news, you'll not react very much to the negative news because you're mostly influenced by the month's news, you know? So instead, here it creates an asymmetry. But it's kind of a trivial generalization of this, yes. Sorry, so um, I'm thinking of the fact that there is persistence in the likelihood of events. But yes, you that's are right. completely abstracting from that, right? Like it's actually about unconditional probability or um, people's views on that actually changes, or? Yes, but the, the today's news, today, okay, today's events only affects my expectations for tomorrow's event if there's persistence. Yeah. So you can think about this as news about the future or news about today that's persistent for the future. So it's the, only the additional sort of I kind of... That's right, it's how I change my, my okay. posterior. So we're not going from zero to positive, it's more like positive to more positive that's than right. it should. That's okay. right. So, uh, so kind of, you know, again, the same formula we had before, but just a little more detail. Suppose we have a, uh, a basically a sort of random walk. To, to today's tomorrow state of the world, tomorrow state of the economy, is going to be just like today unless I get some news. Epsilon, that's the news. Okay? And so after I see how the world looks today, the state of the economy today, I have to predict what will happen tomorrow. Typically, uh, according to this process, I should predict that tomorrow is the same as today. However, in my assessment, I will overestimate those outcomes tomorrow that have become more likely because of today's news. Okay, and so this is captured in this uh, equation here, which is that you know you have your standard uh, updating here. You can you can have here it's just uh, an AR1 process, but you can have learning, you can have whatever. You have the standard uh, rational probability that you have for, for tomorrow's events, and you distort it 
by, by overweighting those events that have become recently more likely when you got news that took you from yesterday to today. So this is the overreaction to news. When theta here is equal to zero, you get the standard kind of Bayesian updating, if you will. When theta is equal to, is positive, you, oh, you're, you're a stereotypical thinker. You overestimate events that have become more likely. So how does this work? So just going back to your question, how does this work in practice? Suppose that yesterday I thought the state of the world would be on average here, but this would be the distribution of the possible states of the world, okay? The possible realization. So on average I'm here. So that was my expectation yesterday. Then today I got good news. <coughs> the economy is doing better, the growth is higher. So you can think about this as, as growth rates of the economy. Today I got good news, so instead of being here, I am now along this curve. So on average, I expect the growth rate tomorrow to be like this, but there's a whole distribution. How, do a how, the, how does diagnostic expectations react to this news? Well, two things happen. First of all, bad states of the world, the left tail here, have become much less likely because I got good news. Second, good states of the world have become much more likely. What the stereotype does is, is, is to highlight the distinctive features of the new distribution, namely the higher probability of good states, and discounting these other states. Okay? So what happens is that the, 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 the stereotypical distribution will further downplay the left tail risk, and the risk of bad events here, and further emphasize the possibility of good events over and beyond what's actually warranted by the information. So, just one second. so what we have is two events, two things happening at the same time. First of all, good news are extrapolated into the future. If I got good news today, I expect good news in the future. Second, you have the if you have good news, you neglect the left tail risk. You, you know, bad things will be are less likely tomorrow, so I completely neglect them. And the, you know, the, the overall product of this mechanism in this particular case is that you just have a shift of the true distribution to the right. And notice what's kind of important is that even if this shift is, is very small, they entailed, uh, they entailed uh, you know, weight on left tail risk she can shift a lot. Yeah. So, um I wonder if this is irrational necessarily. So I get good news that tulips are worth more money. My neighbor just made some money. This is 1567 or whatever. And they just doubled their yearly salary because they bought a tulip. Um, the fact that we all believe this um, yes, means no, that yes. it has this nice self-fulfilling yes. dynamic where tulips actually are worth 10 years salary and it works quite well for That's all right. of our benefit, right? Yes. So how does that sort of get calibrated? Well. Here, again, uh, I'm taking the simplest example where there's no, no markets. There's, uh, there's just you know, an exogenous process which you can know or can learn about. And how do you, how do you uh, deal with this? Um, your uh, your uh, question is interesting because if there is such kind of a marketing mechanism that uh, is, is, has a self-fulfilling aspect to it, then these this predictions would not be wrong, as you were kind of alluding to. Uh, they might be self-fulfilling. Self, um, and what that means is that then these beliefs would not have the properties that we'll show, they will show they have. So the property, w what really comes out of this is that once you have good news, you're over-optimistic and you will on average be disappointed. Because when tomorrow comes, it's not true that the, the state is here, it's the state is here, so you'll be disappointed. And to the extent that you find systematic disappointment in the data, or systematic elation in the other way around in the data, that minimizes the, goes against what you're saying. Now, of course, it, it will also happen, obviously, but the question is, it will tend to f go the other way. So that means that Brexit and Trump are not quite such bad news. That's right, that's right. Well, you never know, you never know. You, you, you could have, you could have some, sorry, you could have something over here, you know, you, you don't really know. Yeah. But, but it, 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 it is true in the sense that, uh, you know, Kahneman has this line, which is interesting, he says, you know, things are never as important as they seem when we are thinking about them. So it's very much along these lines that, you know, you kind of, what's on top of your mind gets overweighted. And so, yes. But I hope, I, I hope it's true. <laughs> 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 
Right, in financial markets, you see a man. That's right. Man commercials. <laughs> this is the system behind that. Well, kind of. So it, it's a short run momentum, but longer term reversal. Um, and in fact, it's a momentum of a different type because it's momentum of overreaction, of the overreaction type, as opposed to the underreaction momentum that you underreact first, and that's why you keep getting good surprises and then keep updating further because you got good surprises because you had underreacted. Here, you get a piece of news, you overreact. You in fact, as you were saying, you extrapolate the good news. But then because you overreact, you revert. So, so it's related. So um, a couple of features of this, of, this, of this mechanism which are important to note. First of all, in this particular case, um, it's very simple to write the, the formula for a representation for these expectations. Diagnostic expectations is exactly equal to rational expectations plus a term, this distortion term, times the news. So in particular, if there's no news, all distortions come from overreacting to news in this model. If there's no news, there's no distortion, you, ha you have rational expectation. So then there are a few properties. First, uh, it displays this kernel of truth. If news are good, you update in the direction of the news, but you update too much. You exaggerate the difference between yesterday and today. Second is context dependence. You can, you can be at the same side of the world, but you can, might have gotten there after good news or after bad news. Your beliefs about the future are much better if you are going up than if you are going down. So how you got to, to places is very important here. And then there's this issue of predictable forecast errors. After you get good news, you, you will on average be disappointed because you're too optimistic. This again is contrary to the standard momentum story. So that's property number one. Property number two is that you're going to have these uh, boom-bust cycles. After you have good news, so suppose there's a sequence of good news, your expectations go up and up and up and up. Then at some point, there's no more good news. And because there's no more news, your optimism goes away. Because your optimism, remember, your optimism is being fed by the arrival of good news. After there's no more good news, your optimism goes away and you converge back to rational expectations. So in this sense, the boom busts, there's a boom-bust cycle inherent to, to updating. Whenever you have good news, you overreact, and then on average, and this is a very general result, it's not, not just in this case, on average, you revert back. So you can think of this as the means kind of... Sorry? Yeah, exactly. so I, if I have time, in, I will, I will uh, I'll get back to that. Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, so boom and bust, there, there's endogenous booms and busts, even, even if there is no uh, bad news just that your excitement goes away after a while. Okay, so now let me, no, exactly, let me uh, go through two applications briefly. Uh, one of them is, about, is on credit markets. So here I have a very brief description of what credit markets are about. I mean, it's really very simple. You know, a firm <coughs> needs capital to invest, to produce, but the output of this production is uncertain. That could be a default. Uh, and investors are ready to lend some capital or buy bonds of this, of this firm. But because of this risk, they require compensation for the risk they take. So the, the firm agrees to repay the capital that they borrowed times, sorry, times this factor, 1 plus R, where R is the required rate of return on the investment. And R is going to be the higher, it's going to be higher, as the firm is believed to be more risky. Okay, this is where the beliefs, the expectations come into play. The idea is that the more risky the firm is, the more uh, the, uh, the investor has to be uh, compensated for that risk in the case that the firm produces to compensate for the fact that he might not get paid at all because the firm is very risky. Okay, so that's it. Uh, the idea is that they expect, on average, the return on investment should be the same or kind of similar to the in return on investment on, in the safe asset, where there's zero risk. So we can define, in this market, we can define a credit spread, which is a difference in the returns, in the return required from a risky firm versus the re return required from a safe asset. That's it. And credit spreads are low, so these returns are similar. <coughs> 
when uh, the firms are believed to be very let, not risky at all, the, the, return, the spread can be very large. So you have to require a much higher return from risky firms when you think the firms are very risky. OK, so this is a figure. Let me let's explore a little bit of the properties of all these credit markets. This is a figure from uh, Greenwood and Hansen, 2013, that basically shows that credit spreads go up and down over time. The blue line, so this is time, the blue line is uh, a measure of the share of credit that goes towards risky firms, so high yield bonds, okay? When the share of credit to high risky firms goes up, this means that people are lending a lot of money to risky firms in fact, they are also lending a lot of money to all firms, but particularly to risky firms. So this is a credit boom. There's a lot of credit in the market. Then boom, then bust, sorry. <laughs> Here's where the share of credit to risky firms goes down a lot. So now it's very difficult for these firms to borrow money. Uh, and then goes up and down, up and down. And what's the degree? So th there's, there's like, um, there's the credit cycles in the sense that the extent of credit that's available, particularly to risky firms, varies a lot over time. Then what's the red line? The red line is the average realized return for investors who, uh, who held, who lent money, who held a high yield bonds, so who lent money to risky firms. Now, crucially, the, this, gra this thing is inverted, so negative, ret returns, never negative excess returns are here. So over time, there's a lot of occasions where people have received negative excess returns. So they've, they've, they've lent money to risky firms, and on average, they got worse returns than if they would have invested in the safe asset. So this really flies in the face of the uh, risk return kind of trade-off. They, they lent money to riskier conditions, and they on average got less returns. And this happens all the time. And in fact, this happens particularly when there are credit booms. When there's a lot of credit out there, when people lend a lot of money to risky firms, that's when returns are lower. So the idea is the following. When people are optimistic about the economy, they lend, lend money to risky firms, which is fine, they should, but they lend too much. They lend too much money at too little uh, an interest rate, a, return, a, a rate of return. And therefore, because many of these firms eventually fail or default, you end up having on average a negative excess return. So the red things are T plus one and two, or T minus one and two? This is returns going forward. Going forward. <coughs> okay. So it's plus one and two. So this is the idea that returns are, are low for, this high, for these risky firms going forward. And so these are two patterns of the, of the data that um, are a little puzzling from the perspective of rational expectations, particularly the recurrent occurrence of negative returns, which diagnostic expectations may, may help maybe uh, may help um, account for. So what's the model like? This is like a verbal discussion of the model. You have a state of the world that determines the productivity of the firms, how risky they are, and that goes, uh, goes up and down. If you have good news, you are uh, too optimistic about the future. You require, as an investor, you require too low returns on your investment. As a result of that, on average, you're disappointed and in fact, you get very low return. This is exactly what Greenwood and Hansen document in their, uh, in their paper. And um, as, as shown in the previous graph, it's also related to this uh, idea of a credit market um, or credit cycle puzzle, which is the fact that the spreads, so the, 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 credit, the boom and bust in credit markets, very much more than the firms, than the actual outputs of the firms. You know, so the, the amount of investment going to firms varies three times as much as the actual variation in the default risk or the output of the firms. So if, if kind of, you know, in a rational expectations world, we would expect these things to go hand in hand. Here, there's a lot of, instead, there's a lot of overreaction. There's a lot of overreaction of investments to expect that of the world. And you know, this literature on this credit spread puzzle finds that most of, this, of the variation in credit spreads is driven by not the standard kind of firm-specific uh, uh, proxies for default risk, but rather 
by a common, so common across all firms, uh, risk aversion factor. So basically investors just are more risk averse or less risk averse over time. And this is precisely, well, perhaps there are other ways to get this time varying risk aversion, but it is something that happens in our model very naturally because when you have good news, people are too optimistic. Bad news, they are too pessimistic. So it's working through beliefs, through expectations, as opposed to risk aversion. So if we take this as a given, as an assumption, I mean, if I look at venture capital returns, will I find the same pattern? I mean, because, yeah. because it's tautological in a sense, right? Over-optimism is going to lead to periods of boom, right? Yep. Because you've got a fear of missing out or whatever it's going to be, right? Yep. And then if you have a reverse and you're going to be, you're, you're going to under -adjust. That's right. The question is, again, the calibration problem. So why is it that you're over-optimistic or over-pessimistic? And, and when, when is it that you are? What do you do about it? I mean, what do you do about it? Yeah. Uh, well, there's, um, there's a couple of, um, of that's like an interesting question, more generically. Uh, 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 I would think that information, it's, because it's a cognitive thing, it's about what information you have on top of your mind, um, providing information can actually make a big difference, I would say. So again, for example, in the, in, the, in the gender math thing, providing information can make, can make a big difference. Here it can also make, uh, potentially can make a big difference. Like reminding people that look, um, in the past this has happened, look carefully, things like this. But I don't have a perfect answer to that. I mean, it's better than, than having like a mechanical wrong beliefs model, because here beliefs respond to information. No, but it could be a little bit like a kettle set, where, where actually maybe the, you know, in other words, the foil here is a rational expectation, right? Maybe you should be just looking in that direction. Right? I mean, one, one could believe that for, I mean, I'm saying more for venture, but I know that, I guess. But, uh, I mean, speculation is just a necessary condition. It's not efficient at all. You know, the argument is it's efficient, it's probably wrong, it's just it's speculation. Sure, yeah. But right? Without that speculation, you wouldn't have that investment period. Uh, Sure. No, but even I mean, speculation can, you know, all of that, you know, speculation again can 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 happen in the context of rational expectations. And you you think things are going to go up, you invest, and it's fine. Um, the question is, well, can you maybe, predict? Maybe individual, maybe individual actors act rationally, thinking that it's going to go up, yeah. right? But the general direction is what you're showing here. It's too, it's too far. So, yes, yeah, so I think the, the, the ultimate goal here is to actually be able to calibrate the model and to kind of predict when and then the what conditions there will be over, like exuberance and in what conditions there will be too much risk aversion. As, As a function of... That would, that would be good. That's would probably buy that So I get that it's all consistent with your original propositions about cognition, psychology, and so on and so forth. But uh, it, it bothers me, and it, it, it speaks to Hans' problem. Um, but I don't think these decisions are necessarily taken by individuals in a one-off way, like we make judgments about yes, maths. maths. Yes. And certainly not in venture capital. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of testing, and there's a lot of all sorts of social cues, and there's all sorts of incentive problems, and so on and so forth. For sure. For sure. But you still, get, you, you still get this. Yeah. You still get negative returns. I mean, I agree. But, it's, yeah, it's but would you explain it by psychology or would you explain it by something else? Because that makes a huge difference to what you do about it. Well, yeah. Is, is it top of mind? If you know, a piece of information arrives at that, is that what really changes an investment decision? This is about how you weight different scenarios in the future. It's difficult. It's a, different, it's a very difficult exercise to weight the different scenarios that can occur in the future. People try to do it. And what this is saying is that there's a systematic bias one way or the other depending on the recent history. And we don't think organizational systems correct for that. Because it could be another source to this part. For sure. I, it's an interesting, I, I don't know enough about organizational systems to see whether they would go in one direction or the other. There's a lot of groupthink as well. So I don't know in which direction they would go. Yeah, sure. For sure, I mean, it's, uh, I'm presenting a kind of simplified stylized model yeah. that illustrates one way in which they can, this can. It's not fully not the full story. It's all impressive background. Yeah. yeah. Good question. All right, so how much time do I have to know? So, um, so there's this, there's excess um, volatility. There's a, a lot of variation in investment. There's not 
corresponding to a variation in, in, out, in actual outputs. And I think the model, and many, perhaps other many of the reasons that the model can actually speak to this. Now, again, the, 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 the second part of, of the model is that after you get a good state, uh, good news, after a while, you're, you're too optimistic. And therefore, on average, you'll become less optimistic going forward. There's this systematic downgrading of your optimism, independently of the news, is a negative shock on the credit market that comes as a consequence of having had a good shock in the past. So it's like it's endogenously creating this boom-bust cycle of good shock, bad shock on the credit market. And that actually is, um, is, uh, you know, is, consistent, is uh, it's consistent with the data that shows that, in fact, low spreads today, so optimism today, predicts rising, opti uh, rising spreads tomorrow. And rising spreads, you know, tightening of the credit market then produces uh, bad economic outcomes going forward, like recessions going forward. Uh, you know, it could be also that the, the, the process itself has some mean reversion into it, but, um, but it's certainly consistent with this. Now, you know, I'm not going to go into detail into this, but the, the thing to do going forward is to actually take a closer look at the dynamics of expectations of professionals. And here's just a couple of figures that illustrate what's going on. Um, this is, a, uh, is, measure, is thinking about credit spreads. This is past credit, uh, uh, time over here. The red line is the credit spreads that have been, that are th the average credit spread in, in the past year. Goes up and down, up and down. Um, the blue line is a forecast error. So how you think the credit spread is going to be tomorrow. So there's a bunch of... Uh, like uh, experts that provide their best estimate for credit spreads in the next year. That's given by the, um, then we, you take the forecast error, which is the difference between the true credit spreads a year, the next year minus the expected credit spreads. And that's the blue line. So you see that when spreads are low here, so people are optimistic, then the errors are high. What it means is that when spreads are low today, people think the spreads will remain low tomorrow, and they are surprised when, in fact, the spreads go up. So it's like, today, life is good. I think tomorrow, life is going to stay good. And in fact, I'm systematically surprised. You know, this is a, the blue line is a surprise, because tomorrow, life is going to get worse on average, and vice versa, when spreads are high. Uh, yes? Uh, so the blue line here is the consensus. The consensus, yes. I don't do anything. So do you know whether in the cross-section of uh, Soviet forecasters, this someone who is closer to what you would call the rational expectation, or they are all revised? Um, I don't think there's anyone systematically uh, closer uh, to the rational expectation. Yes, it's like one agent. Yes, like, like these people. Uh, so it's like one time I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I should take a look. We can talk more about it. And what this graph, it's a very similar graph, what this shows is it's the red line is the same. The red line is the current credit spread. The blue line is your, how you revise your beliefs about the future. So if today credit spreads are low, tomorrow, um, uh, your expectation for tomorrow is that they are too low. But I will revise my expectation upwards on, on average. So here I can tell you how you will revise your expectation going forward. So this is, this is exactly closely related to the boom-bust phenomena, if to the, to the bad shock in credit markets phenomena. If today everybody's very optimistic, I can predict that tomorrow they'll become less optimistic. And that's the fact that the, the blue line, which is a revision, is negatively correlated with the red line. And, and do you get any traction on, on the speed of this? So I mean, is there, is, is there a point about momentum? I mean, so is there any way, I mean, Richard asked if you took a contrarian strategy, you would win, right? But theoretically, yes. you'd only win if you could, if you could predict the speed, right? Well, no, you, you can win, win, win in You can win in, um, in a number of ways. Uh, the question is whether you can win kind of in a de deterministic way, which would allow you to arbitrage this away. Right. And that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a risky thing, for sure. The, the arbitrage would exist, but it's, it would be risky arbitrage. So for sure, I mean, and I'm sure many people So you, you, know you can tell the general shape of it, right? You know what it's going to look like. You just don't yeah. know what the period is going to be. Exactly. 
Okay. Um, we're running a bit out of time. All right, so, so that actually will uh, conclude the discussion of, this, of the credit market. And now uh, I would like to discuss the stock market, if, uh, unless there are some more questions. Okay, so, so in the next 10 minutes, uh, let me talk about the stock market. So what we do here is we take a, an old finding about the stock market and we try to explain it a little bit more, try to dig deeper, okay? So what, what, what's the setting? Financial analysts uh, write reports about the firms they are covering and in particular, they make forecasts about those firms' long-term earnings growth. So how profits are gonna go look, how earnings are gonna grow in the long term. Now of course, these things are closely related, uh, in principle, closely related with prices. What uh, Laporta, Rafael Laporta found in 1996 is that this type of forecast of lo long-term earnings growth systematically predicts returns. So uh, gain, like price movements one year ahead after their, their forecast. So if you divide all firms, all listed firms, into deciles of how much they're expected to grow in the long term, the guys who are expected to grow a lot do on average five percentage points, gr uh, the returns are on average five percentage points lower than the guys who are expected to grow a little. So the, the high growth firms do on average systematically worse than the low growth firms in terms of returns. However, it's not that the low growth firms who do better are also riskier. So you don't, again, you don't have this risk return trade-off. If anything, the high uh, LTG firms, the high uh, growth firms are in fact riskier. And again, they do s perform systematically worse. So what we want to do is uh, to you know, explore this fact. I mean, this, this again, suggests that people are over-optimistic over, over when they make these forecasts, that this over-optimism somehow influences prices, and that's what explains this thing. So that's kind of a, one hypothesis. And what we try to do is to try to look at, at a bit at the fundamentals to see if that actually can explain the data. Patrick, just, just a clarity question. Yes. So, time one, right? So I predict the earnings growth is the growth of an when you when they chunk these these companies up in the deciles, is is that the, I mean is it I mean is that the point where they've already made a high growth forecast? Is the first high growth forecast or? Yeah. So so uh, I'm trying to understand sort of how you yes how you get up there. Yeah. So yeah. I'm trying to think of what's being priced into the stock at time at T zero I guess. So. Um, no, it, so this, this, these uh, portfolios are formed like in December of the year, and so it, it takes into account well, the last artifact, forecast. An artifact of calendar. Yeah, but you can do it in January, you can do it in July, you can do whatever. And you take into account, to form these portfolios, you take the last forecast the, given by financial analysts, which happen, you know, perhaps every quarter. So they give forecasts for uh, earnings, uh, earnings per share mm -hmm. over the, for the next six or eight quarters. Mm -hmm. And then they say long-term earnings growth, which is not defined precisely, but you know, they, des they describe it as you know, average growth three, years, three to five years from now. Perfect, thank you. Um, silly question perhaps, but the null hypothesis here would be that they're all more or less the same level. You know, we expect that. Um, so it's just a kind of a... It's within the bounds of uh, the coffin. Is it? No, you're it asking whether it is. Well, that would be the null hypothesis. Uh, yeah. It would be a say. No, but it's, I mean, I, I, no, it's not. Um, if you, so I, I, th I, th I think it's not. I mean, it's not. Uh, the way to see it, I think, I think to answer your question, is to what if you uh, pursue a strategy where you invest on either the high LTG or the low LTG portfolios over, and then you rebalance every year, and then you see, you know, there's a factor of after like, 25 years is a factor of 10 or something between the two. So it's a systematic yearly after yearly after yearly effect. I think this answers the question. Okay, so, what's, so let, let me give you a bunch of graphs that try to go dig deeper into this. The first graphs are about the dynamics of earnings growth of these firms, okay? So here, you, you, now I'm always comparing the, the highest 
expected growth, the high LTG, versus the lowest growth. Okay? The blue is the lowest growth, the red is the highest growth. Here, this is years relative to formation. So here, zero is a formation year. What happens is that the guys that eventually will land in the high LTG category, the, the guys who people are most optimistic about, have grown very fast for the past three years. Then people are very optimistic about them. The guys who have uh, who end up in the low growth uh, category have performed pretty badly for the past three years. And this is how they perform after formation. So the, the low guys go up again, and you know, also the high guys go up again. This is a distribution of, of earnings growth, computed at the firm level, going forward. What do you see? First of all, you see that the guys who are high earnings growth, who are expected to have very high growth, in fact, perform slightly better, you know, the averages here, performs better on average than the guys who are in the low growth category. But crucially, not much better. And crucially, uh, there's a very fat right tail here, fatter than the left tail. So there's a lot of guys who are in the high growth category that really outperform the low growth category. Instead, the low growth category, you know, it's very accurate. It's really centered around this, this value. Okay? What happens to expectations over time? This is the low growth, sorry, this is the low growth, this, this is the high growth, I'm not sure. So low growth, you know, doesn't change very much, uh, just a little bit, uh, expectations are a bit optimistic, that's a standard effect, and, um, you know, the expectations that don't move very much. The high growth, the guys who end up in the high growth portfolio, they do experience high growth in the beginning, but then they, they kind of slow down. But the expectations of future performance goes through the roof, if you take them seriously. Here's the same kind of a, uh, this related picture, which shows the average expected growth of the high growth firms grows significantly before formation. People are very optimistic about these firms here. But straight afterwards, you know, they're so optimistic, then they, they have a big disappointment. Straight afterwards, the expectations collapse a lot and go down. So again, this, is a, this picture shows there's good news, people become very excited, expectations about future growth go through the roof, then they, on average they're disappointed, and expectations crash. And this is, yeah. Expectations crash, that drives down the return, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what it drives down. Instead, for the low growth, people have become, you know, the, the news are not good going into it. People, ha, you know, lower their expectations for growth. But then going forward, growth is actually better than expected, and expectations pick up again. But it's very small. This is a small amount, yeah. And, and the, the right tail is not enough. The performance of the right tail is not enough in the high growth stocks to counter the group that that's right, because this is what this graph says. It's the, the average is not that different. Right. And in fact, here's the average path going forward. Uh, this is what happens to returns, to prices. Uh, let me just look at the, the right graph. It's simpler. What happens is that the year, this is the returns on, um, on an, uh, announcement dates, like earnings announcements, okay? Uh, in the years prior to formation, you get very big returns for, uh, for high growth firms because they're growing a lot and they're surprising in a positive way the investors. So returns are high. After formation, they drop. and become much, small, much lower than the returns of the low growth firms, which don't surprise very much one way or the other. So this is kind of, again, this the idea that good news, you know, there's a selection effect going into this high growth portfolio. There's good news, people are very excited. Returns are very high. Because the returns are high because people expect them to grow like crazy in the future, then the next year it falls, it crashes down. So, uh, you know, we have a model uh, which we work out in detail, but the idea is that investors here are learning about the quality of the firms. High quality firms grow a lot in, steady, you know, in, in the future. Low quality firms grow very little. How do they learn about the firm, the quality of the firms? They look at current performance. Current performance predicts future performance in the data. This is true in the data. But people overestimate this predictive power, okay? They see high growth. When, when people see high growth here, 
they think all these firms, they're all Googles, essentially. This is kind of the, the stereotype of the model. These firms are Googles because they focus on the, according to the model, they focus on the right tail of this distribution. It is true that some people, so among the high growth firms, there are a few Googles that will be fantastic, but they overestimate how many there. That's kind of where the model goes. Uh, high performance is diagnostic of high quality, but people overestimate how much high quality there is, and they neglect the fact that a lot of the people who are performing very well was just temporary or perhaps due to luck. On average, these high growth firms disappoint, leading to fast reversal and expectations. And then stock prices and returns just mirror this dynamics. Let me just conclude with a picture of the distribution of returns going forward after formation. So previously we saw the average return, now it's a distribution of returns. You see, low growth firms you know, have a pretty uh, nice distribution of returns, kind of narrow distribution of returns over here. So they are kind of more, they are less surprises. There's a little bit of a right tail, but not that much. High growth firms have a very thick left tail here because the, the mass, on average, people are disappointed. So a lot of the firms disappoint and they're over here. But then there's this huge kind of low probability, but you know, a lot of firms out here. So there are a lot of Googles, there are some Googles here, just not as much as people thought. Therefore, Firms in this basket get over, on average, get over, overvalued, leading to the fact that a lot of them display abnormally low returns. Does Google, Apple, Facebook on the writing that's it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty much. But Google is a good image. I mean, I think people try to find the next Google, so it's a good image. Uh, okay, so that's that's the uh, that's the uh, the conclusion. I would just like to say that. Uh, Again, it's, it's, it's a model that tries to have and understand belief formation kind of from first principles, from how people uh, recall information that they have in the memory database. And there is this process of information recall that's driven by similarity or representativeness, which leads to uh, people focusing on the diagnostic properties or the distinctive properties of what they're looking at. And this might lead them to have systematic biases. This can be applied in many different settings, and I think it's, it motivates, it's a very important aspect, is that it motivates a much further detailed study of expectations data and how expectations respond to, to news. So we should take expectations data very, very seriously. So thanks very much for your attention and questions. <laughs>